Most believers do not know that when it has to do with manifesting results on earth here, whether it is um, in the area of finances, in the area of your spiritual growth, in the area of ministry, career, whatever it is, that the way God designed this system, it says the heaven of heavens belong to God. It says, but the earth has he given to the sons of men. You know what that means? That means, I taught you here, that the dominion of the believer is shared dominion. Remember, we discussed this when we were dealing with intercession last week. That the heaven of heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. That means, for anything to happen in the earth realm, please pay attention, there has to be a union of heaven and earth. Are we together? When Jesus wanted to come as the word made flesh, he did not just take a decision from heaven alone. There had to be a participatory walk here on earth. At least we know people like Anna the prophetess, Mary had to donate her womb, Joseph had to be there. To, there were many people who played roles. Otherwise, Jesus would not have arrived. The idea, listen to me, the deceptive idea that anything God wants can happen as a way of honoring his sovereignty. You are right. But as far as manifesting realities is concerned, you are very wrong. You know, because we know that God is sovereign and you are right. It is within his power. If God vetoes man, he's still not wrong because he is God. Are we together? But he has chosen according to his wisdom and his predeterminate counsel to make man able to participate in everything that happens on earth. So when it has to do with manifestations, it is not all up to God and it is not all up to man. There is a role that God has to play. There is a role that man has to play. Ignoring and neglecting your role as a man in hope that God is mighty and he will make things happen may be one of the explanations behind the frustration of many believers. You hear sayings like, one day go better. Have you heard it? That is a very bad way of thinking. It may be a sociological way of deriving comfort in the presence of failure but I guarantee you hoping that one day things will arbitrarily change is, is a total waste of time it takes a foolish farmer who will get up by September and go to one of our farms in the suburbs in Abuja you see him with a car a tractor and different bags where are you going to I'm going to harvest something and you say oh really you didn't tell me you planted you say I hope I know that the way rain fell I can guarantee that there is corn for me now think how intelligent that person is does that sound smart and yet that is the exact same thing people do about life they get up and say, God loves me too much to allow me to suffer. And we drag spiritual and emotional bags and we stand in the middle of nowhere, hoping for a bumper harvest. When it has to do, let me teach you this again. When it has to do with your life and destiny, listen to me. You have an active role to play. An active role to play. The challenge usually is the confusion between the idea of grace and faith. The subject of grace, if not properly communicated, would lead people into laziness because of the awareness of a concept called the finished work of Christ. And that is a fact based on scripture. It is not a lie. But then most people do not understand what the grace of God is. I've done teachings on that and I hope that we'll be able to touch a bit on it. But maybe just for a minute or two, let me talk a bit about it. You see, the grace that most people talk about in the body of Christ is only one dimension of grace. Grace like wisdom is multidimensional. Are we together now? Yes. Wisdom is not just unidimensional. Wisdom has different facets. For instance, divine direction is a subset of wisdom. Divine strategy is a subset of wisdom. So when you say you have wisdom, we must vet what dimension of it. So also grace. The dimension of grace that most people talk about is called saving grace. 
There are different kinds of dimensions of grace. There is the grace that saves. Is that true? Yes. And then there is what we call enabling or empowering grace. That grace does not do for you. It rather empowers you to do with a strength that is not yours. It is still grace. So the idea that the only dimension of grace that is there is that Jesus has finished everything, just receive it by saying, I receive. It's not, um, those who communicate these things are sincere people. Don't get me wrong. And what they are saying is not a lie. It's only that there needs to be completion to it. Because many believers have tried it and it has not worked. Are we together now? So, when you talk about saving grace, the, the, if I will use that expression, the freest of all the graces is saving grace. Because that one is the finished work. But you sit down there and don't confess your sins and don't open up to Jesus and you see that you will go to hellfire. Is that true? You still have a role to play, to hear the word and take a step of faith. Come and stand before Jesus and make that declaration according to Romans 10, 8 to 10. Then you are saved. Here's my definition of grace, generally speaking. Every good and perfect gift that comes from above, listen carefully, given to the saints and accessed only through the office of the Christ is called grace. Every good and perfect gift that comes from above for the benefit or the blessings of the saints, but it is only routed through the office of the Christ. That means you cannot access it except through Christ. 